If you take your copy of God's Word and turn to Ruth uh, chapter 1, Ruth chapter 1, we're going to spend some time over the next uh, month looking through the, the Gospel of, of Ruth, a sweet book uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, we're going to be looking at Ruth uh, for the month of February, and then over the month of March we'll be looking at uh, Esther, just kind of two uh, series as we think through um, what God is doing through uh, these women in the Old Testament. I'm just going to begin in prayer, ready our hearts to hear the word. Father, as we just heard the gospel song, how beautiful it is that all the legal demands were nailed to the cross, that Christ um, set it aside by taking it for us. God, we are so unworthy. We are so unworthy, and yet you freely lavish us with your grace. We are so abundantly grateful for what you've done for us in Christ. Father, I am grateful for what you've done in the life of this congregation, what you are doing in the life of this church. Father, it is a privilege and a joy to pass through these people. God, we pray that you would continue to bear fruit in and through us. God, that you would expand our number. God, but above all, God, you'd expand our heart's devotion towards you um, and love for your people. We pray now, God, as we open your word, that you would do that through this wonderful book. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the book of Ruth is an absolute treasure uh, as we think through what it means to be a woman who lives under Christ uh, and really just God's sweet providence in terms of how he works his plan in our lives. So in our English Bibles, we have one way of how we, how we order and how we structure uh, the, the arrangement of the Old Testament books. In the Hebrew Bible, the way they arrange it, they, they have Proverbs and then the book of Ruth. And the picture is, is that the ending of Proverbs is Proverbs 31, and the, the picture of who, what is the, the righteous woman, what is the, the godly woman of, of the Proverbs, well, it's, it's Ruth. Ruth is the next book. Ruth is a picture of what you see in Proverbs 31. Uh, well, we put it in, in, in its chronological line. So in, in Judges, the period of Judges, as we begin, Ruth chapter 1, it says, In the days when the Judges ruled. Uh, we've looked through Judges recently on, on a Sunday morning, and what the, the period of the Judges where everyone did was right in their own eyes. It was a dark period in Israel's history. Uh, they did not honor the Lord as king, but they, uh, they lived for themselves. Right? There was no king in the land. Everyone did was right in their own eyes. And what you see from the beginning of Judges is you see Joshua, uh, after Joshua died and the elders who, who were with Joshua died, it says there was a generation that rose up that did not know the Lord. And because of the unfaithfulness of the previous generation's teaching and discipling the future generation under Christ, we see this downward spiral of happening in a culture. And I would say, dare say, that I think uh, America is in a period of judges. You have people who, who, who are honoring the Lord, but as that generation has started to fail, they have not passed that on to the next generation, and you see a downward spiral in our culture of drifting farther and farther away from the Lord. And in the midst of that culture, we see Ruth. We see a godly woman who chose to leave her gods and follow the one true God. So in the days of the judges' rule, there was a famine in the land. Now, famine could have been for many different reasons. Uh, sometimes it was an act of judgment. Sometimes it was just an act of testing for his people. So there was a famine in the land. And what land was it the famine in? It was the famine in uh, Canaan, the, the promised land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn or travel in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So if I was going to title the first beginning of the, of the book of Ruth, it would be a deadly rebellion. Right? I do think that uh, Elimelech and his, uh, his, his wife uh, left Bethlehem in sin. Now, they could have left Bethlehem really just trying to find food. That, that is a, I'm reading into the text here. Okay, there's a full disclosure. We don't exactly know why they left um, Bethlehem. It could have been just for food. But I think, at its core, they did not trust the Lord. Elimelech did not trust that God was going to provide for them in their land. Because where did they go? They went to Moab. And Moab was, was known to be an enemy of God's people. So rather than staying with God's people and trusting that God would provide and taking the chastisement uh, of the, um, because of the sin of the people, instead of trusting the Lord, they left God's people and went to Moab. I think if you look at throughout the, the, the history of the church, um, the history of God's people, leaving God's people to go to another place 
in many ways is often kind of an act of rebellion. We see that maybe in, in John where it says that people went out from us showing that they were not really of us. I think the same thing is here in, in Elimelech. I can't prove that from the text. I'm just kind of looking at how um, the, the nature of judges and how people live for themselves and not for each other. Well, when they left, uh, trouble ensued. Verse 2, the, man, the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephrathites from uh, Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. What you see is that you see a, a progression, right? They went into Moab, a place that was God's enemy, and they remained there. And they remained, and then they, they, they progressed to settle there. They actually made a, a home there. So in verse 3, uh, But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. Now, there's no place in the scripture that says that an Israelite can't marry a Moabite. What it does say, they can't marry women who worship foreign gods. And Moab, the Moabites, worship foreign gods. Uh, the main uh, god was, um, it's escaping me, Kalon. Gary, is that right? That? Thanks. <laughs> He's sitting in the front row for help. Um, so there was no prohibition that they couldn't marry more foreign women, but foreign women who worship other gods. So, um, so we see that these took more about wives, and the, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there for about ten years. And both Malon and Kilion died, and so the women were left without her two sons and her husband. So they went looking for food, they went looking for sustenance and, and needs, and, and, and all their uh, their desires for uh, famine to be filled with. Um, the necessities of food were, were almost undone because in that day a, a woman who did not have a husband couldn't provide for themselves. Uh, so they, they went looking for uh, necessities and they were really undone. So there was a deadly rebellion um, in their lives, their families' lives. The second picture here is their desired rest, uh, 6 through 14. Then... It says, Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. <clears throat> so she heard through the grapevine that God had visited their people and provided them food. It was one of the reasons why I think that they should have never left in the, in the first place, was because God is faithful to, to care for his people. They, they chose not to trust, trust the Lord. But it's interesting here that uh, both... Naomi and her two daughter-in-law started to go back towards uh, Bethlehem. They heard that God had, had met them there. Uh, they were looking for rest, probably rest from dealing with lack of food, lack of, of provision. Um, so verse 7 it says, So they set out from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. They were progressing there. And somewhere along the way, Naomi stops and looks at her daughters-in-law. She says, go return, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So even though using the word the Lord there, uh, the Lord, when you see it in all caps in, 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 the, New, in the Old Testament, it's, it's the covenant name that God has given his people, right? I am the Lord. I am with you. I, I'm connected. So, so Naomi is giving the covenant name for God to, to be with them. May the Lord deal kindly with you. Now, we don't know uh, in terms of the, the nature of judges. There was always kind of this syncretism. So in the period of judges, there was people who worshipped Yahweh, but they also worshipped other gods. There was this kind of this mixing of different religions. So we don't exactly know where Naomi was in her faith. We don't exactly know how much Orpah or how much Ruth knew of the Lord. We can make an, an assumption that they knew something, uh, because even right here that she would have said, they made the Lord deal kindly with you. Now, why did she have to, to go? Well, in, in, you see as, as the story goes on that uh, in that day, if a husband died, it, what the, the, the wife would do would be marry a brother. And they didn't have any, uh, Naomi didn't have any other children, so she would have said it would be forever for me to have another child for you to marry. Go back to, to your family and find rest. You see that in verse 9. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So go back to your family and find another husband and, and live and thrive there. 
Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and and wept. You, you see here that there is there's this emotional attachment Now we don't know. I mean, how their relationship was. And this is a, a mother in law with her daughters in law. And we all know in, in terms of history, sometimes a mother in law and a daughter in law don't always get along. Right. Uh, but they do here. Right. There's, there's an intimacy there. I think partly is because I think deeper relationships are born out of adversity. So when you go through trials and struggles with people, sometimes the depth of that relationship is intensified. So they have lost uh, a son. Naomi lost two sons and a husband. And Orpah and um, Ruth lost their husbands. They were grieving together. And I think what that grief did, it bound that family together. I noticed when I was, been, I've been a pastor here for five and a half years. And um, I think the grief that our church has shared collectively in saying goodbye to dear uh, men and women of God has bound our church together, right? Uh, we know that the, the scripture says that those who mourn, they shall be comforted. And I think the comfort comes by being in community, right? And the, 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 the friendship and the depth of relationship is born of that adversity. Those of you who were there with you when you have gone through loss, you will never forget those moments. And I think it just deepens that, that friendship. Verse 10, and they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. They said, no, we want to stay with you, Naomi. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they, are, they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. You know, we know where this story is going. Many of you have been walking with Christ for a lot of time, long, long time. I mentioned it this morning. We know that God is going to show up in Ruth and Naomi's life. But let us just stop for a moment and realize how hard this is for, for the whole family. There is, it's, when it says that the Lord is against me, his hand has gone out against me, that's how it feels when you're going through that trial. When you're going through loss and losing people who are that close to you, you feel the Lord is against you. Now, sometimes God brings uh, death into our life uh, as, as, as a chastisement. We can see that in the scriptures. Sometimes death happens because we live in a fallen world. And God wants to bring his glory through it, to manifest himself. God has many purposes in, in death and in trials and persecutions. But in that moment... Naomi is, 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 is doubly bitter. She's bitter because she has feeling the bitterness because she has lost her husband and her, and her sons. But she's looking at her daughters, as she calls them, and they don't have sons. And what is their life going to be? Empty and alone. There is more grief there. And the, gr the human soul can be full of grief. Now, there's, those of you in, in this room, some, some of you have gone through periods of grief that I can't even fathom. You may understand that Naomi, Naomi's life far better than me. But in both cases, in, in the return to Bethlehem, they want rest. They want rest from their wandering, rest from sojourning. They want, they want to be with a community that loves and cares for them. Uh, and, and even Naomi, in her, in her kindness, she wants both Orpah and Ruth to go back to their families that they may find rest uh, with their husbands and not deal with the bitterness in, in her own life. But what we see here is we see a turn in chapter 15. We see a determined resolution, right? A resolve in Ruth's life. Look at verse 15. It says, Ruth clung to her and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. It's interesting that Naomi, a follower of Yahweh, the one true God, would send uh, both Naomi, both uh, Ruth and Orpah back to their gods to, to not follow the one true God. She sends them away. Why? Well, because in her mind, it is better for them to have a husband than to have the Lord. 
Do you know how many people, how many young women, think it is better for them to have a boyfriend or a husband than the Lord? They have drifted far and far away from having the one true God as Christ, the bridegroom, as, as their husband, uh, the only thing that they really, only one that they really need, but desiring that life of fulfillment in a, in a spouse have drifted from the Lord. Or the same thing for, for a man, that if I, I want to make her happy, I'm going to choose someone that will love me, even if she doesn't know the Lord, and drifted and, and started in relationships with people who are going to pull them from the Lord themselves. Naomi sends them back, tries to send Ruth back along with her sister-in-law. But what do we see about Ruth? This, this godly woman, this virtuous woman, Verse 16, but Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. From where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And that's always kind of quoted in weddings, right? It's not a wedding verse, right? It's a picture of, of a, a daughter-in-law's resolve to be faithful to God and faithful to the commitment that she, that she made. I will go where you go and where you lodge. I will stick with you. Then she says this, which I think this is key for, for Ruth's life. She says, your people shall be my people and your God my God. That is the great refrain, the great promise of the Old Testament that is fulfilled in Revelation 21. So when Jerusalem falls down in Revelation 21, it says that I, I, God says, I will be my, your, your God and you will be my people. That is the fulfillment of the promise, promise from Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. That through the seed of Abraham, I'm going to make a people uh, to, to bless, uh, uh, through the seed of Abraham, to bless all the families of the earth, right? To be a multitude of nations, as far as as many stars as there are in the sky and, and sand on the seashore. There's going to be a people of God for his own possession. And God's promises, I will be your God. I will go with you, and you will be my people. And what Ruth is saying here is, I want to follow the one true God. I trust the promise of God. I trust that, that, he, that he says that you, will be my, you, that you will be my God and I will be your, your people. And Ruth says, yes, I want to affirm that. She says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more, if anything, but death parts me from you. Man, that's a character, isn't it? Right? She just lost her, her husband. Right? No hope of having future children going back with her, not knowing what's, what's going to happen. We know the end of the story, but in that moment, all she knows is that God is more important than my family. God is more important than these, these false gods. I trust Yahweh. I want to live for Him. That's what we want in our lives. We don't want to seek the, the blessings from the hand of God. We want to seek God Himself. That's where that great verse in Habakkuk, right? If there's, there's no uh, fruit on the vine. If we have nothing, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Right? That's the kind of character and substance we want as the people of God. We don't want to be takers of God's good gifts. We want God Himself. That is the gospel. God, as John Piper would say, is the gospel. That's, if we have God and nothing else, we are good. And yet what, we, what, we, what happens, even in the book that we just finished in our Women's Discipleship class, Conversion, it says that we can see a false convert. We can reveal to them if they, if they think that I'm happy to go to heaven even if God is not there. We know that someone is probably not, not a true follower of God. But think about all the, all the, all the songs that we have in our hymnal that, that, that point to that day when we get to see our Lord face to face. When he, when, he re, when he reaches out to us and says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of, of your master. We get to fall at his feet in worship. We get to touch his nail-scarred hands. We get to touch his nail-scarred feet. We get to see the, the, the holes of his, of his brow and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, my God, my King. Ruth here was determined to stick with Naomi. She was going to let her yes be yes and her no be 
No. And Naomi wisely in verse 18, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. I, I'm not going to convince you. You can come, right? Um, this is the kind of character we want, isn't it? This is the, 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 the virtuous character of someone who really knows the Lord, right? That we are so um, bent on following God that whatever anybody says to us, they know that we're not going to fall, right? When I first became a, a believer, I was living in a house uh, with seven guys, guys I love to this day, right? And they often tried to get me to deny the Lord, right? It could be with, hey, you want to go out drinking with us? It could be sitting in a room watching a football game and turning on inappropriate things on the television to see if I will leave the room or, or walk away, right? But I was resolved. I will follow God. Like, I wish I could say that I did it perfectly. And there's times that I, I fell in, in those years. But I, I want to have the heart of Ruth, right? I'm determined to follow my God. Yes, I'm going to fall. Yes, I'm going to fall. Then I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to run after the Lord. Because He is my God. And I am one of His people. I belong to Him. Not because of anything that I have done, but because of the mercy He has given me in the Lord Christ. See, even, even there in, in what Ruth is saying, she believes in the promise that God has made. Not in what she can do, right? But in the promise that God has made to be their God. Well, lastly, let us end with this the divine return, this divine return in the end of chapter 1. So it says, So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. Now, we don't know why they left, but maybe they left and felt that they were abandoned, Right? Remember, Middle Eastern culture is all about the community. So to leave and abandon a community was a very big deal. Our culture, people pop from place to place and we're not really really centered. But that culture, if you left the community, there was that was a big deal, right? So they came back, but guess what? She came back and she didn't have a Limelech. She didn't have Malon, she didn't have Killian. She had a Moabite. Conversation stirred. Now, it doesn't, we don't know from the text. It could be they were stirred in excitement. Knowing the period of Judges, I don't think that's the case. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord, for the Almighty, has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Guys, that's just grief. That's just, that's just full-hearted grief. She, she's not speaking against the Lord here. You notice what she's doing? She's not saying that God is wrong for what he's done. He's just, she's just saying, this is, this is what I, the Lord has, has dealt bitterly with me. The consequences that the Lord has, has brought me through has been challenging, has been calamity. You know, and, and we don't know the responses there. We don't know the responses of the people. But sometimes in a situation like that, you got to let people work through that. you got to let people work through that grief. Mara is, really means bitter. And really the, some, one, one commentator said it's, it's bitter and pleasant, right? Which is kind of reminds me of even the, the text this morning. Right, that the word of God is both sweet and bitter. What God does in our life is always, in one sense, sweet because we know that we we were His. I was telling my kids this morning we're, we're memorizing for James uh, one. Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. The testing of your faith, because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And I just said, guys, um, there's going to be times in our life where we can't trust or we can't see God's hand. We don't know why He's doing what He's doing. But we can always trust his heart. It's a great, great, great quote by Charles Spurgeon. In this moment, um, Naomi probably is probably not trusting either, not trusting the Lord's future for her. Uh, and yet, even here, she's she hasn't she's still alive. She's not destitute. She's got a, a daughter-in-law in Ruth. But I love this in verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite. It's interesting that throughout this book, you see that, that title for Ruth, Ruth the Moabite. 
She's not an Israelite. And yet, she's the righteous woman. She's the virtuous woman. One who was outside the camp that God brought in. It's just a, a, a sweet picture of God's power and salvation. Moab had her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem. Oh, at the beginning of the barley harvest. I just love that air of hope. Now, we, don't, we know that the chapters, the divisions aren't there, but it's almost like they came back. And when, when did they come back? They came at the time of the barley harvest, the time of hope, uh, the time of celebration, right? And what is God going to do? God is going to use this harvest to introduce Ruth, Ruth to, to Boaz and eventually um, leading to having a son, Obed, to Jesse, to King David himself. So I guess when we look at this picture in, in isolation, it could be, man, this is a, a rough story, right? Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. Elimelech's following his own, his own wills, leave, leaving his people away from the community and, and the faith. Uh, trials and tribulations fall upon them, death. Uh, and then we see, but we also see this great picture of faithfulness and Ruth, and we see this air of hope. You know, I think when we read scriptures, and we see how God works in the, in the midst of bitter providence, we can just trust that God is on the move. God is on the move, y'all. Like your life, I don't know what God is doing in your life. I don't know what you've been through. But I, I know what you're going through now, but I know that God will carry you to himself. So even though when I think about Revelation, and I think about how God is going to unleash judgment and persecution and trials upon, uh, upon the world, uh, in, the, in the book of Revelation, martyrdom is victory. If you, if you face the wrath of the beast and you die and your life is taken from you, you're still in the Lord's presence. You still have the Lord. And I think sometimes in God's sweet kindness, what he does is he, he allows things in our life to show us his power. Because the only way that Ruth is going to be redeemed is by a redeemer. And that when she came back, there was no hope of a Redeemer. But praise God that there was one. And pray, praise God that there is one for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and died to redeem us from all lawlessness, to make a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for uh, Ruth and her faithfulness to stick by um, Naomi. God, we pray that we would be the kind of people um, to have a steadfast resolve uh, to follow you, God. Uh, that you are our God and we are your people and that we will not turn away. Father, we thank you so much for how you work in our lives, even through the midst of trial and pain. God, I pray, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, those who are dealing with things right now that are difficult and challenging. God, I pray that you would just work your will in their life, God, that you would work a a sweet providence for them like you did for Ruth. And yet, God, even if you don't, oh God, I pray that their faith would be steadfast in you, that they would, they would trust you, that they would know that you are good and that you love them. For their good and for your glory's sake, I pray. Amen.